Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Gathering. It's great to have you in worship with us today. I'm Matt Miofsky, the lead pastor of The Gathering. And I also want to say a special thanks to all of you who are listening to us online today. I know some of you do it week to week, and you send me emails, notes sometimes, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, last week, just this past week, I was uh, at a meeting with about 25, 30 leaders of Methodism from all over the country. We were talking about the future of Methodism and our denomination. And after we got done, you know, there were some people that I didn't know as well. And, and one guy came up to me and he said, hey, Matt, you know, what, uh, what made you want to be a pastor? Now, let me just say, I get asked that question, I don't know, hundreds of times probably I've gotten asked that. And I have uh, well-worn answers that I give. I talk about, you know, I I don't know, I went to college, I got involved, played football, got involved in FCA, and I kind of tell the story of how it happened. But every once in a while, the question will catch me off guard, as it did this past week, and, and I pause, and, and the guy noticed it. And I got to tell you, the reason I paused was I get stuck sometimes on the phrasing of the question. He said to me, hey, Matt, what made you want to be a pastor? And, and here's the thing. As I think about it, as I sat there thinking about it, I'm not sure I ever really wanted to be a pastor. Now, I know that may surprise some of you. Just hear me out on this. But I didn't really ever want to be a pastor. In fact, if I remember back to the 21-year-old version of myself, being a pastor was nowhere on the short list. The truth is, back then I had no idea what I wanted to do. I felt a great deal of pressure. I had this newly gained expensive uh, degree from a college. I had majored in math. I had been told all my life, you can do whatever you want to do. But here was the problem. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I began to, to panic. And there were all these competing voices in my head, a ton of options of what I could do. But then there was also this kind of quiet, quirky voice. I don't even know really where it came from that said, hey, Matt, instead of all these jobs that you're considering, instead of all these fields that you're considering going into, what if you went to seminary and explored ministry? And I immediately pushed the voice away. Do you know why? Because seminary and whatever path that was going to look like offered me almost none of what I knew I wanted in my life. Like, for example, I wanted a, a good job. That didn't really seem like a path to a good job. I wanted to get to choose somewhere cool to live. That was not a path to get to choose where you wanted to live. They tell you where to live. I wanted to do something, if I'm honest, kind of impressive, that would impress people. That is weird. That's not going to impress anybody. I wanted to make a lot of money. This was not a path to making a lot of money. I wanted to be, be secure, have a secure uh, environment for a family that I might start one day. And that did not seem like this path. The truth was seminary and the idea of ministry never really offered me anything of what I wanted. But then all of a sudden, as these other options began to be eliminated or for whatever reason weren't working out, it just sort of turned out that uh, by the summer after I graduated from college, this quiet, quirky voice was sort of the only one left around. And I decided, kind of late in the game, to just sort of go with it. And I signed up for seminary. But, but the short version of my answer is really this. I didn't really choose to be a pastor. It sort of chose me. I didn't want it, but apparently God wanted it for me. And as I say that, I don't mean to say that I didn't have any free will or choice in it. I did. I don't really mean to to say that it's not what it didn't interest me at all. But what I'm trying to get at is it's not really something that I wanted to do. It's something that I felt like God was calling me to do. And, and the truth is that over the course of my life, I've had several experiences like that. I bet you have too, not necessarily going to seminary or something like that. But I bet you've had these kind of experiences where, where you have so planned out what you want, but then there's this other option. There's this other nudge. There's this other kind of prompting. And at first it looks like nothing about what you want, but something about it won't let you go. And you have a decision to make. Do I go with what I immediately want right now? Or do I maybe give myself over to this nudge that I'm feeling in my life? And if you've ever experienced that, then, then you begin to know that, that there's a difference in our life between what we want and what God wants for us. 
There's a difference sometimes between what, what we're prompted to do and what the Spirit of God is prompting us to consider. And it's that difference that I want to talk about a little bit today. We're continuing a series today called Saving the Best for Last. And, and we're talking about the last week of Jesus' life. And today we really get to one of the, I'll just be honest, uh, probably the most emotional story in the gospel thus far. It's emotionally kind of wrenching and almost hauntingly human portrait of Jesus' life. It's the night where Jesus prays in the garden. To understand the timing of all this, let me just kind of tell you where we've been. You know, last week we talked about the, the Last Supper and the washing of the disciples' feet. That happened on Thursday night. And what the story says that when that dinner was over, when Jesus was done at the Last Supper, he left there and he went immediately at night to go into the garden. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane and to, and to pray. And the story says that he took with him three of his disciples. It was Peter, James, and John. Now you have to understand the timing. This was to be the last night of Jesus' life. He knew that um, over the course of that night, he was going to be arrested. He would be put on trial. By three o'clock the next day, he would be crucified on the cross. And so the story says that before all of this was to happen, Jesus took this night to go into the garden and to pray. And, and when we get to the, the portrait, that story that was just read, I mean, immediately we notice some things that are, that are so strange for us to see in Jesus. I mean, one of the Gospels says that, that the night was so intense that as Jesus was praying, he was sweating drops of blood. At one point, we see almost like his, his commitment waver as he says, you know, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. And all of this is the backdrop, though, for uh, the prayer that he prays when he's there. And what Matthew says is that Jesus actually prayed a prayer. It's a simple prayer, but he prayed it three different times. Now, uh, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know this, but I'm going to give you a little trick. If anything happens three times in the Bible, if it happens in a row and it names it three different times, that's like saying, hey, this is really important. You want to pay attention to it. It's like the Bible raising a red flag and saying, I want you to do this. If, if you repeat something three different times, it's just a way of saying, hey, I want you all to pay attention. This is really, really important. And so it says that, that Jesus there in the garden three different times prayed a prayer. The, the first instance of the prayer is in Matthew 26, verse 39. Let me read it to you. It says that Jesus said, my father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. It's that simple. Now, just really quickly, before I go on, what is Jesus? I mean, Jesus knows what the night is going to hold. I mean, in just a few hours, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to experience nearly the entire range of human emotions and experiences. And yet, and so we can understand that when Jesus says this cup of suffering, I mean, this is a big deal. He says, you know, God, I don't particularly want, if there's any way for us to accomplish this in any other way, if you can take what I think is going to happen and, and do something different, uh, I would love for you to do that. However, not what I want, but what you want. And, and then it says that he goes and checks on his disciples in their sleep, and he wakes them up, and he says, I want you to stay awake. And he goes back, and he, and he prays the prayer again. It's a little bit different this time. Matthew 26, 42, my father, if it's not possible that this cup be taken away unless I drink it, then let it be what you want. Essentially the same prayer. Story says he goes back, the disciples are sleeping again. He wakes them back up and says, please stay awake, pray for me. He goes back and the story just says in Matthew 26, 44, um, again he went and prayed the same words for the third time. Now, before I get to what I think that prayer means, I want you to just think about the intensity of what Jesus uh, was going to face. I mean, in this instance, we see Jesus' humanity on full display. It's maybe the best example we have of seeing a Jesus who wants one thing. That's Jesus' will and, and, and God's will, which is pointing in a different direction. 
And that's what it says. He's wrestling with his will versus God's will. I mean, his idea of what's best and God's idea of what's best. What he wants really to have happen and what he thinks God wants to have happen. And remember, Jesus knows that this is the beginning of the very evening that he will experience a whole range, as I said, of not only emotional but physical suffering. I mean, he has in store for him in just about a 12-hour period, I mean, betrayal by his very best friends, denial. Broken friendships and and loneliness. He's going to have to face a trial and unjust accusations and a bogus verdict. He's going to have to face a, a, a jeering crowd and no one sticking up for his defense. He's going to be mocked and, and ridiculed and physical beatings and torture and, and nails hammered through his hands and through his feet. By 3 p.m. the next day, he knows he will be executed by the Roman government with the onlookers doing nothing to stop it. When we read this story and really think about the the setting, then we don't have trouble understanding why Jesus might kneel down and say, God, if there's any other way, please. Uh, You know, one thing I'm struck about this part of the story is, I mean, just in that short range of time, Jesus in one night is going to experience nearly every human suffering we could or can even imagine experiencing. I mean, Jesus in this instance knows what it, what it feels like. He can identify with any of us who, who have ever gone through in, any of the things that I just named. But not only that, he can identify with our desire not to want to do it. Three times he indicates that if it were up to him and him alone, he would prefer that the cup pass. And so Jesus in this moment is do something that we all completely understand. He's basically saying, God, I have what I want and you have what you want and I think I'll stick with what I want. But even as he names that, the story says that he is finally able to lay aside his will and to turn himself over to his fathers. Now that's the story, and and when I I think of this story, I mean, there's so much about it that we could mine and that we could talk about. Uh, You know, I consider kind of two things right off the bat. First, when I read this, I I just think about the immensity of what Jesus did for us, not only on the cross, but just even in leading up to the cross. I mean, we see in this story and the way they tell it, it's, it's it, almost comical if it wasn't so painful that Jesus is praying and all he asked the disciples to do is like stay awake. You know, you're in church for like one hour. All you got to do is stay awake. And he says, just stay awake and pray. And he, go, and he goes and he prays and he comes back and they're sleeping. They can't even figure that out. And three different times. And what we see is almost this contrast between Jesus' deep faithfulness to God and, and our Uh, unfaithfulness, our inability so often to even do the basics. And I'm struck in this moment in the garden of just what Jesus does for us. Jesus does here something that human beings could never do. He does something that we're not capable of doing, but he does it for us. And it's just an element of the story that highlights Jesus' faithfulness against the backdrop of human unfaithfulness. It reminds me that ultimately Jesus did things for us that we could never do for ourselves. By the way, that's why we worship him as Lord. He's not just someone to follow, but he is a, a person who did things that we could never do. The story reminds us of that, but there is this second part, and that is when we read this story of Jesus' deep faithfulness to God's will instead of his own will. We can't help but think about, like, what about us? How are we supposed to respond to this? How can we have even a fraction of the same attitude that Jesus had in the garden? Now, as I say that, I'm not suggesting, and I certainly don't hope, that the kind of trials and decisions and and, and forks in the road that we face are anything like the ones that Jesus faced. I hope they never are. 
But I think what, what Jesus brings up in the garden is something that we are asked to consider in our life. And that is, what do we do when um, we have over in, in this bucket what we want to do, our desires, our will. And over here, we have this nudge th- that seems to indicate God's will. Are we able, like Jesus, to ever lay aside what we want in order to pursue maybe what God wants for us? And by the way, I think it's a fair question. Some people say, well, man, that's Jesus, that's not us. But in other places, Jesus says, no, this isn't just what I'm going to do, but this is what I want you to do. I mean, the prayer that Jesus left with us, the one that we pray every week here at the gathering, what does it say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What? Thy kingdom come. That means yours. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every week we pray, God, I want it to be your will and not just mine. You know, the best word, by the way, for this, and it's an old-fashioned one, is that I think Jesus, in this story, is challenging us to consider what it means to surrender ourselves to God. To surrender ourselves to God. I know that's a, a, a word that doesn't get a lot of traction in our day and age. What does it mean to surrender? Well, here's my working definition of surrender. I think surrendering is this. Surrendering to God's will is not giving up or giving in, it's giving over. That's what surrender is. Surrender is not giving up. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think when a lot of us hear about surrender, we hear about like kind of giving up, especially giving up uh, control. I mean, we have a version of life that says your life is yours. We have autonomy. We get to choose. We get to determine what we want. And um, you be whatever you want to be. You make yourself happy. You do what you want to do. You take care of yourself. I mean, that's kind of how our whole world is built. You worry about you. I'm going to worry about me. And to surrender seems like somehow to give up uh, the autonomy that we're given as part of our life. To give up the ability to make decisions about our life and that our life is our responsibility. It, it, It seems like we're supposed to be giving up one of the gifts that God gave us. But, But when Jesus talks about surrender, I don't think it means giving up. It certainly will challenge sometimes our control, but, but even when Jesus says, God, not, not my will, but I want your will to be done, I mean, this is Jesus not losing his control, but using his control to choose God instead of himself. It's not exactly giving up your control. That's not what surrender is. And similarly, I, I think we think of surrender sometimes as like giving in. And what I mean by that is really like resignation. Like we're just, we're going to give in to whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You know, I think a surrender is like waving the, the white flag. Or um, we talk about this sometimes in, in war and in a boxing ring. And surrender is just saying like, I got nothing else that I can do here. It sounds tantamount to just giving in. And I'll give you an example of where I see I see this a lot in life, in work. I see it especially in marriages and relationships. Any of you have been in a relationship or been married for any period of time, uh, you know that we will hit difficult seasons in our marriage. And sometimes when we hit those seasons, it seems like everything you're trying, every, every gesture, every thing you try to say or do that you think might fix things uh, only makes the situation worse. And if any of you are stuck in that season of life or in marriage, uh, I want to say that I I get it. I know there are those moments where it feels like everything you try to do just makes the situation go further and further down. It can be frustrating. It can be painful for people on both sides, and it can feel hopeless. And I think in situations like that in marriage or in life, it is really easy to say, there is nothing else I can do. I just have to give myself in to whatever's going to happen here is going to happen. And so then we stop trying. And we stop pushing and we stop fighting and we stop working and we just resign ourselves to almost like fate. Whatever's going to happen here is just going to happen and there's nothing that I can do about it. I think that's giving in. But, but when, when Jesus talks about surrender. When I, when I use that word surrender, I'm not talking about giving up. and I, I'm not talking about giving in. It may be a fine distinction, but I think it's an important one that Jesus isn't asking us to give up. Jesus isn't asking us to give in, but Jesus is asking us to give over. Surrendering to God's will 
isn't giving up, it's not giving in, it's giving over. What do I mean? What I mean by that is I don't think surrendering is so much letting go of our own hopes and dreams, but instead it's like giving over our hopes and dreams to God. I think that surrender isn't so much giving up hope or giving in to hopelessness, but rather realizing that our ultimate hope lies in God leading and not our own leading. It's not about stopping to work or to fight or to try, but it's, it's to make our working and our fighting and our trying subservient to what God is trying to do in our lives. It's to put ourselves and our dreams into God's hands being open to God, shifting them or changing them or guiding them, sometimes in a very different direction. Surrender is not about a loss of hope. I think it's about gaining hope. And even as I name that, I don't want to sugarcoat what I think our faith asks us to do. Jesus in this moment, I think, is challenging his disciples to say there are going to be many points in life where there's going to be what you want, And then this nudge of what God wants. And when you hit those moments, I want you to surrender your will to God's. And let's be real about this. This is not necessarily fun. Sometimes surrender will mean saying no to your initial desires. And instead, doing something that you don't particularly want to do. Sometimes surrender is going to be... um, saying no to something that you really want and yes to something that you don't immediately want. Sometimes surrender is sacrificing and it's sacrificing real things like your time with things that you don't want to do or your money with things that you don't want to give your money to. Sometimes it means sacrificing your immediate happiness for the sake of something potentially greater. Sometimes surrendering means to give up your dream And to explore what dream God might have for you. Sometimes surrendering means to stop trying to control so many of the details of your life. And to instead just believe that that God will take care of some of those details that we can't control anyway. But, But what I want you to see is underneath that word surrender is really a different idea. To say that we're surrendering to God is really all about trust. When Jesus says, I don't want you to give up, I don't want you to give in, I just want you to trust God enough to give yourself over to God. So we don't surrender in hopelessness, we actually surrender in hope. I mean, going back to that list, I mean, God doesn't ask us to say no to our initial desires for no reason. He says, say no to this and trust that what I have for you is even better. God doesn't say, hey, I want, to, I want you to sacrifice something in the short term just to be miserable. Like, hey, give your money away or give your time away or, or sacrifice your initial happiness for nothing. God says, I want you to do that and trust that I can do something more important with your time or with your money or, or for your long-term joy or happiness. We surrender control about the details of our lives sometimes with the trust that in God they're going to work out differently. And so when I see Jesus in the garden, I see really a portrait of immense trust in God. That somehow God's will is better than ours. And that God's path is better than our path. And sometimes that nudge that comes from God can produce more in our lives than the nudge that comes from us, even if in the short term it doesn't seem like something that we want to do. I mean, that day when when Jesus made his will subservient to God's, it was the worst 12 hours of his life and probably anyone's life. But his faithfulness produced for us forgiveness and hope and life. Let me be clear. You are not Jesus. And I'm not Jesus. Jesus. We're not, I don't think, ever going to be able to do exactly what Jesus did. And thank God we don't have to carry the burden that Jesus already carried for us. But I do think that when we read this story, we're challenged to think about the small ways in our life 
that we can respond to Jesus' immense surrender with many surrenders of our own. And so today, I want to ask you, what in your life maybe do you need to surrender to God's will? Where do you experience maybe that tension between what you really want to do and and where that nudge from God is saying, but maybe I want you to consider this. Where in your relationships maybe do you need to surrender something to God or or in your your work or with your time or what, what do you need to do in order to follow the nudge that comes from God and maybe say no to what you initially want to do right now? I'm going to end with this because um, to me it's one of the most beautiful examples actually of the power of what it can mean to surrender. A lot of you been around a little while know that this month we've been celebrating every week in worship greater things. And Greater Things two years ago was a generosity initiative. We cast this big vision for our church that included um, all sorts of ministry expansions and a new McCausland site and renovations at our Clayton site. And, and we said that, you know, we think that God has huge things in store for us, but we don't think we can get there without all of us deciding to practice generosity, something that Jesus uh, d- decides to do or asks us to do. And boy, if you want a great example of something that people really don't want to do, start getting up here and trying to talk about money. I'm serious. So immediately, I mean, you you start talking about giving, and that is something that most of us do not want to do. Talk about sacrificing something now for the sake of something else. And yet, even when it comes to money, there's this consistent call in Scripture to surrender sometimes what we have to give it over to God to do something greater. And so two years ago, that's what we did. And, and you know, the the result was absolutely incredible. So many of you committed to give in really generous ways. Over two years, we had this goal of not only giving a certain amount, but being able to expand our ministry. And, And here's the cool thing. This is the end of it. It was this month, two years ago, that we started. And so this month is the conclusion of that. Today is the conclusion of that. And so many of us who have given regularly today get to make kind of a final gift. We we hope to do it. But my point is this, that This has been a living example of the power of surrendering something that maybe in the short term does not feel like something that we want to do. But we've gotten to see the power of of turning what we have over to God for God to do something far greater than we could have ever achieved on our own. It's a simple but profound and powerful example of something that Jesus invites us to do in every area of of our life. So as we close, I want to thank you already gathering for the ways in which I think you do surrender time, energy, money, and and give it over to God to do something uh, greater. But today I want to challenge you, where in your life today, where in your life today do you feel that tension? The tension between what you want to do right now and, and maybe what God is nudging you to do. And today I want to encourage you to find a way to practice surrender. Not giving up, not giving in, but giving over to God with the trust that he can produce something greater. With that, I invite you to bow your heads and let's pray. Gracious and and holy God, we do love you. And when we read this story, we are reminded just what you did for us on the cross, that in the garden and through his suffering, uh, Jesus, Jesus died to sin so that our sin could be forgiven. Jesus paid a debt that we could have never hoped to, to, to pay. Jesus underwent a suffering so that we could have uh, something that that is much more beautiful than suffering. Jesus dealt with guilt so that we don't have to live under a cloud of guilt anymore. And God, we're so grateful for what Jesus was willing to do by following you with perfect faithfulness. And today, God, my prayer is that we can just respond, not in any way like what Jesus did, but in the small ways that we can can find uh, the challenge to surrender our will, 
and to give more of ourselves over to you. And so God, may, may that spirit be in us today, challenging us to ever more surrender ourselves to you. It's in Christ's beautiful and holy name that we pray. Amen.